we've been studying through the book of Genesis on Wednesday nights. And uh, when you come to, to Genesis chapter 6, there's an issue of, of some rebellion that's going on in the world. And when you, when you look into what's going on, you see that Satan is involved with the rebellion. And uh, as I started studying those things, it just got deeper and deeper. And I thought, you know what? I'd like to do a study on Satan's strategies and, and, and how he presents himself. So today, that's what we're going to do. We're going to begin a series on Satan's strategies where we get to know our adversary, the devil. We get to know him, how he operates, why he does the things that he does. What, what is his goals? What is it, what's in his mindset? So go ahead and get 2 Corinthians in chapter number 2, 2 Corinthians chapter number 2. You know, we, we live here on the earth, we, we exist, but why do we exist? Well, God created us. And uh, He created us to live in a perfect paradise with blissful fellowship. But why are we not in that paradise? Why are we not getting to experience, you know, perfect, perfection and, and just love and peace and joy? Because instead of living in that, we're living in a current experience of struggles, pains, heartache, and, and just, just wickedness around us, deceit that goes on. And it's because the perfect land has turned into a battlefield. And we have an enemy. We have an adversary. Our lives are lived on a battleground. Our lives are in a battle. Uh, whether we want to be or whether we don't want to be, we're there. And so we're going to fight against this enemy. And everyone who is still alive has a fight. Because we either fight for the unsaved to come to the knowledge of the truth or to, to come to understand the gospel, or we fight for the saved people to come to the knowledge of the truth. And so regardless of where you find yourself in life, whether you're a lost person in need of salvation or you're a saved person in need of edification, there's a fight that needs to be had. And so we must fight. But many don't even know that they're in a battle. Many don't even know that they have an enemy that they're actively opposed. And of course, that's just how the enemy likes it, right? Because if, if you're in a battle and you have the advantage of surprise on your side, isn't that always to your benefit? If the enemy, if, if the enemy doesn't even know, if you're getting ready to be attacked and you have no idea that you're getting ready to be attacked, you're not on guard, are you? So, you know, the enemy came into Pearl Harbor and bombed the ships as they were sitting there, and we were caught off guard. You know, the sucker punch from the right. Do you think things would have been the same if we knew Japan was coming? No. So, obviously, the enemy always wants to have surprise on their side. The best military strategy is deception. It's always deception. The best military strategy is not to be bigger, stronger, stand in front of you. Of course, bigger, stronger helps. <laughs> But the best military strategy is to catch someone by surprise. And if you have a wise enemy, what do you think that they're going to try to do? They're going to try to catch you by surprise. Now our enemy, Satan, just happens to be described as wise. And so we would expect that. So in our study, what we're going to do is we're going to study our enemy. We're going to get to know him, who he is, his characteristics, how he thinks, what it is that he's doing, and how it is that he does what he's doing. And if we know these things, we can be better prepared. Now, understanding that we're approaching, this is a serious subject, right? Not one to be taken lighthearted. Because what is the enemy about? The enemy is about death. So the battle that we're in is, you know, not, not arbitrary, but it's meaningful. And so we, we approach this seriously because it's a reality. We have an adversary and he is actively opposing us. Actively. And so the name Satan itself means accuser or adversary. It means to obstruct or to oppose. So we have someone who is actively, he's an adversary of us who is opposing us. So when we're talking about Satan's strategy, we're talking about the way that Satan opposes us. It impacts all of us. Satan is a deceiver. And if you know that your enemy is a deceiver, he's going to be uh, weaving, you know, these deceptions. But if you know what the deception is, by the way, you've got a book of truth in your hand. What does truth help to fight against? Lies and deception. And the truth, actually, that book you hold in your hand will tell you what your enemy's playbook is. 
I mean, you know, there, there's football going on. I, I don't watch the NFL anymore. Uh, I know some men do, and they, they put up with the heartache of the, the local teams. But, uh, um, you know, if, if these football teams went into their games knowing what their opponent's playbook was and exactly what they, was going to, they were going to do before they did it, what do you think that their chances of success are? Obviously, that increases. Now, if you had the ability to know your opponent's playbook, if you had the ability to know your enemy and how he works on the issue of not a football game, but on the issue of life and death, would you not want to know it? Look, you may be sitting there today thinking, thinking well, I'm saved. I'm, I'm kind of good. So, you know, maybe this, maybe this uh, study will be good just to, you know, I'll learn some things about Satan. But when you think about it, just because you're saved, not all of us have come to the full knowledge of the truth. None of us have come to the full knowledge of the truth. But just because you're saved, does anyone in here not have any unsaved loved ones? Does anyone in here not have some loved ones who are maybe saved that they would like to see to come to the knowledge of the truth? If that's the case, then you have the ability, if you know how your adversary is working, you would be able to use that wisdom in your daily life to help not only yourself, but your loved ones around you, whether they be lost or saved. So this is a beneficial study for all of us. So we study these things because we don't want to be ignorant of his devices. Thus we turn to 2 Corinthians chapter number 2. Look at verse number 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse number 11. It says, Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Now our goal, our goal this morning is not to take a deep dive into 2 Corinthians chapter number 2 and, and see what's going on there. But I want you to notice what Paul says there just in the second half of the verse. That, you know, Satan won't get an advantage of us if we're not ignorant of his devices. So the goal in this study is for us not to be ignorant of our adversary's devices, who he is and how he operates. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we love you. We're thankful for this time that we have the ability to meet together freely, Lord, and we're thankful for your word, which works in us who believe, Lord. And we're thankful for the truth that we have. And we're thankful, Lord, that you left, didn't just leave us here without ammunition against our enemy, Lord, but you've told us exactly what to look for. So we pray, Lord, that we would just uh, um, see these truths from Scripture, that, that uh, Lord, we would teach the things that you would have taught and, and people would hear these. They're freely, Lord, and we're thankful for your word, which works in us who believe, Lord, and we're thankful for the truth. Amen. So we want to we study our, 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 our enemy here, and if we're, ignorant, if we're not ignorant of his devices, then we'll be better equipped to, to battle against him. If I were to ask you the question, by and large, just a general question, if you think that people are generally wise to Satan's devices or ignorant of Satan's devices, what would be your answer? Ignorant, ignorant. yeah. Put us all in that camp, right? We're, we're all fighting this battle. This is not, you know, someone, I'm not standing up here. We're not talking down to people. We're not talking down to each other. We're saying this, these are things we need to know. These are things that we need to know to be able to, 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 to battle. So by and large, I think the majority, majority of us have no clue what is going on. And so we need to arm ourselves. Today's lesson is just an introduction. Today, we're not going to get into the meat of any of the subjects. What I want to do is I want to back up, and I just want to take a look and point out some of the things that we're going to be looking at during the study. So instead of digging into something a mile deep, we're just going to be looking across the surface of some of the things that we'll be covering in more detail later. So if you understand why we just kind of go through these things quickly today, you'll understand we'll spend more time on these in the weeks to come. The first thing I want to do is look at Satan's creation. If you go back to Ezekiel chapter number 28, Ezekiel chapter number 28, <clears throat> people ask the question sometimes, you know, why would a good God create the devil? Well, God didn't create the devil. God created a cherub. God created a, a light bearer, Lucifer. That cherub became the devil. You know, it's, you could ask the same question, well, why would God create man? God didn't create sinful man. God created a man with the ability to love. And if you have the ability to love, you have to be able to choose freely. And so man has, has chosen to, 
to join with Satan in his rebellion and, and, uh, from the garden, and man has an inherited that sin, and so we have a sin problem that needs to be taken, taken care of. But when we look back at that Lucifer's original creation, Satan himself, you see that Satan wasn't created to be your adversary. God didn't create someone for you to have to battle with. Ezekiel chapter 28, look at verse number 2. God talks to Ezekiel, he says, Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, Thus saith the Lord of God, Because thine heart is lifted up, and maybe I should just stop here and say, when you look down through this passage, you're going to see God is giving a prophet. He's going to talk to, have Ezekiel talking to the, to the prince of Tyrus. Later on in the chapter, he says, say unto the king of Tyrus. But when you find out who God is talking about here as the king of Tyrus, you're going to understand and know that this is Satan himself. This was no man that came along to be the king of Tyrus. And, and you can see it from scripture. He talks about those who were in the garden. And we know that the king of Tyrus was not back there in the garden with Satan with uh, Adam and Eve and God himself. But he says, uh, Say unto the prince of Tyrus, Thus saith the Lord God, Because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a God, I sit in the seat of God, in the midst of the seas, yet thou art a man, and not God, though thou, thou set thine heart as the heart of God. There's a couple of things I want you to notice here as we as again, we just kind of skimmed through. You notice there where it says in verse number two, his heart was lifted up. From the very beginning, what you're going to see with, with Satan, and, and the issue will always be, the theme is pride. Satan wanted to be lifted up. And uh, what's interesting is, God created him in a position that was already exalted, but it wasn't good enough for him. He wanted more. And he says that he's the, he talks about him as the, the prince of Tyre. Uh, Tyre. You know, Tyre was a great city. So when Satan is going to go after people, where's he going to find them at? He's going to find them in the cities, right? So you have from the very beginning, he's going to attack where the people are. He wants you, and he wants the people. So uh, likewise, same strategy for, for Paul. When they went and they were ministering, where did they go to? The metropolises, right? The city to get the word out. But anyways, it says, Thou hast set thine heart as the heart of God. There's the, there's the issue. As he, look at verse number three. Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that they can hide from thee. The issue with Satan is going to be about his pride, but it's also going to be about his wisdom. And what, what do people who have pride like to think about themselves? Look at how smart I am, right? Look over at Romans chapter number 16. Romans chapter 16. In verse number 3 of Ezekiel, and I didn't tell you, but hopefully you held your place in Ezekiel. We'll, be, we'll go back there real quickly. But what it says in Ezekiel 28 is it said in verse number 3 that, that no secret can they hide from thee. Satan thinks that he's so wise that nobody can hide anything from him. Right? I'm so wise. I've got it all down. I'm, I should be in the place of God. Nobody can hide anything from me. But yet God comes along, and of course, we, have, we don't have the time this morning to lay the groundwork, but I just want to show you something. Just in case you think that maybe Satan is the be-all, end-all, let's put Satan in his place. Romans chapter 16 and verse number 25. It says, Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel... Paul is the one who wrote the book of Romans. Paul is the apostle of the Gentiles. It's unto Paul that the revelation of the mystery was committed. He says here in, in verse number 25, Now to him that is of power, that's the Lord Jesus Christ, to establish you according to my gospel, that's the gospel that Paul preaches, and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to... Now what is the preaching that Paul preaches? It's according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since when? The world began. When was Satan created? When the world began. Back when the morning stars were, they all sang for glory when God created. God kept something secret. Satan says, there's nobody, there's no secret that they can hide from me. Nobody can hide anything from me. And yet, what did God do in Satan's ultimate defeat? Is he, he, he withheld a mystery from Satan. 
whereby he would destroy Satan when he revealed how he was going to redeem the heavens and the earth. And so the secret that winds up being hid from, from Satan, which we'll cover in more detail later in later lessons, is the ultimate things that destroy Satan. So all of these things that Satan says back when he's created, God turns around and uses for his own destruction. We serve a wise God. Satan is not the only wise God. Our God is the only wise God. And he fools Satan and takes him in his own craftiness and puts him to an open shame and insults him in front of the whole world. Now, what do you think that Satan thinks then about Paul's message that he's preaching? I don't think that he likes it very much. If somebody put you to an open shame, you did something wrong, and they put you to an open shame and expose you, and you're lifted up in pride, you're not sorry about it, how are you going to like it when it's, you know, confronted? So there's a, there's a rebellion there that's going on, and Satan is outdone by God himself. Ezekiel chapter number 28, go back there. Ezekiel chapter 28, let's look back down in verse number 12. It says, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Now Satan is definitely wise. Don't get me wrong. All I'm saying is God is greater. But you need to understand that your adversary is not some dote. <laughs> your adversary is a wise creation from God. He was why? So your enemy is going to have a very good strategy against you, the best. So you need to know what God's strategy is to defeat the adversary strategy. Because you're not going to make, if you try to defeat Satan on your own, you're not going to be able to do it. You're not going to find it within yourself, within your flesh, within your good works to try to overcome Satan. So he's perfect in beauty. He's not only wise, but he's beautiful. He's got it all going on for him, doesn't he? Verse number 13, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardes, the topaz, the diamond, the barrel, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. You know, let's just throw in the gold there at the end, right? Because the other ones weren't beautiful enough. And gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes, those are like, you know, the, the percussion, so he's, he's got this music that's in him, was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. Satan is not God. He's a created being. God made him. He doesn't have the right to be God. He's a created being. Verse, verse 14, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. And I have set thee so, thou wast upon the holy mountain of God, thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till. And that's an awful word there. Till iniquity was found in thee. You ever thought what history would be like if that word till was not there? If Satan continued to be perfect in his ways and never fell? how things might be different. But he was perfect till iniquity was found in thee. Satan was created without sin. God didn't create Lucifer as the devil. He became the devil. Now get verse uh, Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah chapter 14. So we see his uh, creation. There's also the issue of his fall. Of his fall. God documents for you what your who your, your adversary is, what he's about, and he describes his fall in, in, in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 14, look at verse number 12. It says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? What do you think Satan is in the business of doing? Weakening the nations. There's a whole, there's a purpose of God in the nations. And Satan is going about to weaken the nations. Verse 13, For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. 
I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will be like the Most High. What's the attitude of Satan? He wants to go to the top, right? He wants to usurp what God has, and he wants to be numero uno. He wants to be the number one guy. And so you see this attitude of pride all throughout Satan, you know, who Satan is. If you want to describe Satan and his characteristics, he's a prideful being. Prideful being. Now, the main issue of Satan's fall is that he wanted to rise. And when he wanted to rise, God took him for a fall and brought him down to the bottom. Satan wanted to ascend and be the most high, and he's going to wind up in a bottomless pit, one that has no bottom. Quite the contrast, isn't it? Look over, get, uh, hold, hold Isaiah 14, get Genesis chapter 14. In Genesis 14. Now, since, the issue, since, since Satan's fall, the issue has been a battle, a battle between good and evil. You know, maybe you've heard that term used before, right? A battle between good and evil. And that's been the issue. The issue, though, is where is the battleground? There's a battle in the heavens and in the earth. And it's a battle for all of creation because Satan, even though he knows he can't be God, what can he do to free will beings, free will creatures? He can come along them and, and, and tempt them to join his, his rebellion, right? To join his side, come with me. He was successful in doing that to a great number of angels. And he's been successful in doing that to his system of doing that to uh, all of mankind, uh, 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 I would say a majority of mankind. But the basic thing that's going on in Scripture is a battle for heaven and earth. Look at Genesis chapter number 14 and look at verse number 19. It says, And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. Now, God comes along and he blesses Abram and he chooses to use Abram to bring about his purpose in the earth. Abram was promised a land and a people and a throne that would come through David, through his seed, and it would be established forever. God's purpose in redeeming the earth and his strategy, God's strategy in redeeming the earth was to use the nation of Israel, which would come through Abraham's seed. And God tells, there's a definition here of who God is. When you talk about the most high God, it's defined as the one who is the possessor of heaven and earth. But now flip back to Isaiah 14. I ask you to hold your place there. And what, does, what is it that, that Lucifer says, that Satan says in verse number 14? He says, I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will be like the most high. Now, if he's going to be the most high, what does that mean? That he's going to be the possessor of heaven and earth. So from the very beginning, we have a battle, a battle for the heavens and the earth. And when Satan says, I will be like the Most High. He wants to usurp that authority from God and rule all that you see. So when you read the scripture, you find from the very beginning the issue of a battle. You're in the battle. It's just which side are you on? You know? And by the way, you know, you're either, you know, you've heard the term, you're either for us or against us. Because if you're not for us, if, if there's just apathy, guess what? Satan's gaining ground. So we, we strive towards the mark. Get 1 Timothy chapter number 1. And as you're going to 1 Timothy, get, get a, a Ephesians chapter number 3. So just understand there, the, the issue from the beginning has been about the issue of the earth and God's mystery program to redeem the heavens from Satan's rebellion. Now, it's, it's God's wisdom here that's, that's fighting this battle. 1 Timothy chapter number 1, look at verse number 17. It says, Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, 
the only wise God. Be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. You know, your king is in a battle. Um, when it says there, it's interesting, he's called the only wise God. You know there's gods in your Bible with little g's, right? That they're called gods. And Satan is called the wise being. But you know what? When you reject God's wisdom, you're no longer wise. You'll, you may be crafty and cunning, but you're no longer wise. Say, God turns and he's the only wise God and he turns Satan's rebellion back around on him. Look at Ephesians chapter number 3. When God uses his wisdom to turn Satan's rebellion back around on him, Ephesians chapter 3 and verse number 10 says, To the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. You know what we as saved believers today in the church, the body of Christ, is doing? I told you that God's had a plan in the earth through Abraham and through the nation of Israel from the beginning. Today, in the dispensation of grace, there's a new message that been, that's been committed to the Apostle Paul and is going out to us, where we're saved by grace through faith alone, apart from circumcision and the works of the law that's required. And, uh, and, and what God is saying today is that those principalities and powers and authorities in heavenly places, those are angels up there. And we are making known unto them the wisdom of God of what God is doing today through us. What is He doing through us? He's saving you and, and, and giving you Christ's righteousness and saving a body of believers where there's both neither Jew nor Greek and has given us heavenly places. He's blessed us with all blessings in heavenly places. Our home is in the heavens. Satan never knew that God had a plan, what his plan was. Satan was concentrated on the earth. You know, we talked about war and deception and what's the best strategy. Satan's down here concentrated on the earth, and what does God do? Flips the script on him, sends Christ to die for us, forms the body of Christ where he might redeem the heavenly places. And Satan and his angels, there's a day coming where they will no longer have a place in heaven. They're, they still have access to heaven today, as you can read in the book of Job. There, but there's coming a day where that will no longer be the case. Now, so we, we've read there about um, his creation and his fall. And now that he's fallen, he's got some different characteristics. He's no longer, you know, he, he's not the wise one. He's not the anointed cherub that covereth. Now there's some different names that are used to describe him. We use names such as Satan, the devil the serpent, the dragon, the wicked one. You know, it sounds a bit different than the full of wisdom and beauty and all of these things. These are different characteristics, right? Because if you think about a serpent, a serpent is cunning. It's subtle. You think about a dragon, it's, it's, it, it's monstrous, it's great. But it's terrible. And so, even though these words describe who Satan is, how is it that Satan appears today? Well, Paul in 2 Corinthians tells us that Satan appears as an angel of light. So people today, you know, they think they, their images of Satan is of, you know, some, red, some little red pudgy guy with horns and a tail and a pitchfork that's walking around. And they think that if I see something that's ugly and bad, that would be what Satan is. But that's not how Satan operates, is it? Satan is in the polished things of life. Satan is in the beautiful things. He was the most beautiful creature. He's in the glamorous things. He's not down in the gutters. That's where man's own sins take them. Man's good enough at bringing himself down to the gutter. Satan doesn't have to go there. So Satan appears attractive, but he'll kill you. Just like sin may appear attractive to you, but it'll kill you. The wages of sin is death. Now, there are certain things that Satan wants, too. So we, 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 he's got different characteristics now. Go back to Isaiah chapter 14. Or I could just reference it quickly. Back in Isaiah chapter 14, we already looked at verses 13 and 14 about the I wills of Satan. And what did Satan say? He said, I will be like the Most High. Satan has certain desires. Satan has a will. 
And he wants to be like the Most High. At the end of the day, that's what Satan wants. He wants to be in the place of God. He wants to be the one that's worshipped. He's prideful, right? He wants everybody to fall down at his feet. And he does everything that he can to oppose God. Because God is in the position that he wants. And so he's working to overthrow him. He wants to keep people in his kingdom, in Satan's kingdom, the, the rebellion against God, where he's got his, his grips on people. And he wants to oppose people from, to, from coming to the knowledge of the truth, which will give them life, because Satan's all about death, and it'll give them life and put them into the, you know, God's kingdom, general sense, high terms. Satan doesn't want that. He wants to oppose God. He wants to keep people on his side, and he wants to keep them in ignorance. Do you think most of the people that are going about and, and living contrary to God and are caught up in Satan's ways, do you think that they're actively acknowledging Satan as like Satan worshipers? That's not the way that it works, is it? You just get caught up in it, and then you live your life that way. You know, Satan's deception to Eve was very subtle. And lies are spread to mankind today, and they follow those lives. They live their lives based upon those lies. And they never know who it comes from. And they never know who their father is. So Satan hates you. You want to know why he hates you? Think about it for a second here. What was the thing that Satan did from the very beginning? He was prideful. He wanted to be like the Most High. He was not content. He was the most beautiful creature, the wisest thing that God had made. He was the anointed cherub that covereth. He had a position that was above the throne of God. He was the most exalted creature in all of creation, and yet he wasn't satisfied. Today, when you put your faith in Christ, it says that we're complete in him. Over in 1 Timothy chapter number 6, it talks about godliness with contentment is great gain. What is godliness? It's God's life living through you, right? So it's, it's talking about those of us in the body of Christ being content with what God has done for us. Satan was never content. I think he hates you for it. Because that's the exact opposite of him. You've got something that Satan never had. Contentment in your Savior. Contentment in your Creator. Satan never had it. So, when you base your life on yourself, and you build up your own goodness, your own righteousness, your own works, in a sense, and you know, we don't have the time to, to map all of that out, but that works. That's exactly kind of what Satan did, right? I, I'm going to do it myself. God's put me in this position, but I want to be like the Most High. I'm going to go out. I'm going to do it myself. I can do better. I know better than God. And people today are living their lives on the basis that they know better than God too. I'm going to do it my way. I'm a good person. I can get to heaven. And those people are in for a great fall too, just like Satan. Now, that fall that, that happened, the fall took place in the heavens. Uh, over in Job chapter 15, it talks about the heavens are not clean in God's sight. So now that there's a rebellion, it's, it's, there's a rebellion in the earth with mankind, there's a, a rebellion in the heavens, and God has a plan to redeem those heavenly places. But Satan has a strategy, and Satan's strategy is to counter the purposes of God. So Satan hates God, and Satan thinks that he's wise. And whatever God is doing, it's not just to counter God, but it's ultimately to usurp his authority. And so God is the most high, and Satan says, I will be like the most high. Everything in time past in the dispensation that God has been looking to accomplish has been actively and vigorously opposed by Satan himself. Now, that's kind of the purpose of our study. You know, we'll spend some time talking about who Satan is, but to see his strategy and how he's actively opposed God, you will see that from the Scriptures, everything that God does, Satan actively opposes. Now, the will of Satan is 
verses and in contrary to the will of God. If you go to 2 Timothy chapter 2 really quick, Satan has a will. I mentioned earlier that Satan wants to keep you on his side, right? He wants to keep you on his kingdom. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, if you look at uh, verse number 26, 2 Timothy 2, 26, it says, And that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. Now that's what I'm talking about when we're talking about not being ignorant of his devices. There's snares that are inlaid. That are laid. In, uh, in Sunday school, as we were teaching through the book of 1 Timothy, it talks about snares. We talked about what those are. When someone lays a snare as a trap to catch someone, how are the snares laid? The, the snares are laid, and then people walk along, or animals that walk along in the snares, and they get caught when they don't expect it, right? The snares are, are camouflaged, are hidden so that they don't see it, and they try to catch them by deception. But it always catches someone when you're, when you're not looking, right? You think if the animal knew that that snare was there, they'd go in and put their paw in it? No, that's not how it works. A snare is meant to capture someone. That's what the devil's looking to do, and he's looking to keep you captive by him at his will. Satan has a will. That's what he's looking to do to you. And men and women today are taken by his devices, but we ought to be wise and not ignorant. Now, one of the main characteristics of Satan now is that he's a liar. 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. If Satan were to lie and is actively opposing something today, just in your mind, what would you think it is that he would be opposing? You know? 2 Corinthians chapter 4, look at verse number 3. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world, small g, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Does Satan have the ability to, to hide things, to blind people? Absolutely. Why does Satan like to lie? Because he wants to blind people from the truth. He's opposing God. He doesn't want you to know what God is doing. He doesn't want you to know what the gospel is that will save your soul. He's trying to bring as many people down with him. That's what he did when the, when the angels rebelled, right? The scripture tells us that the angels rebelled with him. He went over there and told them what his strategy is and said, Hey guys, come on, follow me. We can do this better. And people went with him. So the lie is set. So Satan wants to blind people to the issue of the gospel. And I don't think that the issue of Satan's strategy today is not gross sin. Satan's strategy today is not just trying to get people to be as sinful as possible. Satan's strategy today is trying to keep people from being saved and from coming to the knowledge of the truth because that's what the will of God is. And when you look in your scripture, when you look in your Bible and you read what the will of God is, you have a very good sense that that's exactly what Satan is doing the opposite of. Satan wins when people teach from their pulpits that you've got to do something in order to be saved. I mean, that's exactly what he planted in Eve, was it not? Go back to Genesis chapter number 3. In Genesis chapter number 3, when Satan approached, and I'll, I'll, for the sake of time, I'll, I'll, I'll speak about this in brevity. But in Genesis chapter 3, when Satan approaches Eve, he tells Eve, you know, ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day that you eat thereof, that your mind shall be opened, your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. What is Satan planting in Eve? Discontentment, right? God doesn't have your best interest at heart. I do. And if you but eat this fruit, your eyes will be opened. You'll have knowledge. You'll be like the gods, knowing good from evil. And Eve goes, wow, that sounds pretty good. You know, there's a temptation. There's a lie of getting off the contentment of God. Satan tells him, you're not going to die. Satan's lies are always about suppressing death, right? Because he brings about death. But he suppresses death. He lies about the consequences and promotes death packaged with a pretty bow on it. 
sin. But the gift of God is eternal life. Satan brings death. God brings life. So he taught, Satan taught them to be malcontents. As I said, Satan wasn't just content with being a beautiful creature. He wasn't satisfied with being wise. So he comes along to Adam and Eve, and he, and he gets them to be discontented. He sows discord, and he plants the thought. And what is, men, what is, what is Satan telling men today? You know, don't retain God in your knowledge. Romans chapter number one. You know, you too can be like God. You know, just, you can be your own God. You know what's best for you. Be the best you. Just be yourself. I, I hate that term, just be yourself. Because if most people were just to be themselves, this would be a terrible world. Be like Christ. Satan gets you... That's, that's what the culture tries to do. You know, be comfortable with who you are. Even if you're in gross sin, just be comfortable. Be proud of who you are. Pride. Oh, watch out for that word pride. If you're going to have a pride parade, I'd be, I'd be careful what the subject of that parade is. And if you just work hard enough, he says, you can be good enough. And so what does the whole world think today? They think that everybody's going to heaven, right? Someone dies. Oh, I can't wait to meet him in heaven. Because, hey, you know, if we can just be good enough, that's the lie of Satan. That's the lie of Satan. Satan tries to tell man, you can do it. But when you get saved, it's coming to realize the exact opposite, isn't it? That you can do nothing. God does it all. Christ did it all. So we're told that we're all under sin. That's what Paul tells us in Romans. That we're all under sin, and if we're all under sin, then we're all going to die. So Satan's lie of just, you know, you can be good enough. The good works doctrine. By the way, if you know that you're saved by grace through faith, and there's false teachers that are coming along that are teaching that you have to work, you know work doesn't mix with grace, so you know that's opposing grace, you know they're Satan's ministers. So just come along and do some good work. But the scripture tells us that there is none righteous. The standard to enter across the threshold into heaven is perfect righteousness, and you don't have it. There's only one that does. There's only one that does. Being justified freely by His grace. We have redemption through Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood. Christ offers it as a gift. Satan tells you, you can work for it, you can do it, you can be good enough. That appeals to the flesh of people. Satan says, oh, that, that blood, that, you know, that's, so, that's so undignified. Don't mess with the blood. You, know, you, can, you can do it yourself. We can be refined about this. So anyways, if he wants to, to blind people to the truth of the gospel, you would expect him to be working in darkness and deception because God is light. And the truth brings light, and Satan is working to suppress the truth. Satan is also a counterfeit. He's a counterfeit in his positions. The Lord Jesus Christ is both a prophet, a priest, and a king. Satan looks to be a counterfeit in those positions. Because Satan says, I will be like the Most High God. So you read in Scripture of who the Most High God is. You read of of who Christ is, and Satan comes along and he wants to counterfeit everything that Christ does. He's a counterfeit Christ. He wants to be like him. So he imitates him in every way. You know, when the I said Christ is a prophet, priest, and king, Satan wants to be the same way. You know, when Elijah stood up against the prophets of Baal, who's Baal? Who were those prophets of? Those were Satan's prophets. You know, Satan has talked about being the, the king of all the children of pride. Satan looks to be a prophet, a priest, and king. You know, when you look at the Godhead, you have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And Satan looks to counterfeit God, and and he does that by the unholy trinity. You have Satan, you have the, the Antichrist, the beast, and then you have the false prophet. Now, I know that time is escaping us. Satan has, when we talk about Satan's strategy, Satan has a strategy that changes with God. And uh, what I mean by that is 
here at Grace Bible Church, we're a dispensational Bible church. We understand that God has worked in different ways at different times with people. So God has worked differently with Noah than he did with Abraham. God worked differently with Abraham than he did with Paul and those of us in the body of Christ. So as God has changed his purposes, not in his essence, right Carl? As we learned this morning. As God has changed his purpose, Satan's strategy changes. And so I'll just very simply say, when you know what God is doing, you know what Satan is doing because he'll be doing the exact opposite. And so Satan has a strategy that's involved in, in working against, in, in the past, God here, God promises the seed line that's going to come through Eve. And what does Satan do? He actively tries to stamp out that seed line so that the Messiah cannot come. When God works today and he's trying to, to uh, save people by grace through faith, simply believing in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ on Calvary, what does Satan do? He comes along and says, mix a little law with that grace, won't you please? And moves you off of Christ. And then for the saved individuals, what does he do? God wants you to be complete in Christ. The mystery of godliness, having Christ's life live out through you, and Satan tries to move you off of who you are in Christ. The scripture also tells us about Satan's defeat and his ultimate destruction. Over in the book of Ezekiel, God says, I will destroy you, O anointed cherub. And when God destroys him, he says, it's interesting because Satan, what does Satan want? He wants to ascend, right? He wants to be like the Most High. God says, I will destroy you. I will cast thee to the ground. I will bring thy ashes upon the earth and never shalt thou be any more. My point being here is that Satan, his destiny is destruction. But during this present toil that we live in this life, we fight a battle against Satan. And he's wise. I'd like to conclude with this. If you turn to uh, Philippians chapter number 2. Philippians chapter number 2. As we go through this study of Satan and his strategy, I would like you to keep in the forefront of your mind the one that we serve, the Lord Jesus Christ, is the exact opposite of Satan. We read about Satan and we see his pride. We, we, we read all of these things about Satan and we're like, you know, he's a bad guy. He's a bad guy. The God that you serve is the exact opposite. You know, you serve a loving God. You know, we serve a God who genuinely loves us so much that he gave up the best that he's had, his own son, to come and die for, for you, for each and every one of us. He's a self-sacrificial God. But he's the exact opposite of Satan, and I'd like you to keep that in your mind. How terrible Satan is, and be, you know, let's, ha let's have a heart of thankfulness for the God that we serve. That he's not malicious like, like Satan. Philippians chapter 2, look at verse number 7. Paul says, and in, in, in here in Philippians chapter 2, Paul is talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. He says in verse number 7, But made himself of no reputation... What is it that Lucifer wanted? He wanted to be exalted. What is it that Christ did? He humbled himself. He made himself of no reputation. It says, and took upon him the form of a servant. Lucifer didn't want to serve God. Lucifer wanted to be served himself. He wanted to be worshipped. And yet our God came in the form of man and came and in the form of a servant. It says, and he was made in the likeness of men. You know, Lucifer was a brilliant creation. Beautiful and precious stones. And our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, was a man of mud. You know, that's what your bodies are made up of? Water and dirt. A man of mud. He descended down and Christ took upon our form to save us. He didn't come down brilliantly arrayed with crystals and, and precious jewels and gold and, and walk around. And No, our God humbled himself to save us. And being found in a fash in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. Is that not the antithesis of Satan? Satan, with pride, I'll be lifted up, and the Lord Jesus Christ comes along and says, I'll humble myself and save you from your enemy, 
from your adversary who took you. You know, I could just stay up in glory. It'd be much easier for me. But he humbled himself and became obedient unto death. Lucifer couldn't even bother being obedient unto life. He had life. He was there with God in the throne room. Lucifer couldn't even be bothered to be obedient with that. Even the death of the cross, the very thing that dealt the death knell to Satan, the death of the cross. So the battle, when you look at that right there, is that really a battle about might? You you know the phrase that might doesn't make right? God isn't right just because he's powerful. God is right because he's good. So you can't overcome wrong with might. The way you overcome wrong is with right. And you've got a blemish. We had a blemish. And the way that you overcome that wrong is not with power, but with rightness. And God offers His righteousness to you. God came down in the form of a man and humbled himself, and was obedient unto the death of the cross to save you from the clutches of your adversary, the devil. And he takes away your wrongness and replaces it with his rightness, his righteousness. He defeated Satan on the cross, and because he's defeated Satan, you and I can have victory over this adversary that we're going to be talking about. You and I have victory over him. Now let's fight the battle against Satan. Because as he's actively opposing us, let us actively oppose him. And as Christ has come and has, has defeated Satan on the cross, if, if, if you're someone that's in Satan's clutches, if you don't know what it's like to have Christ's righteousness applied to your account, Christ has made it easy. Because he took all of the hardness He took all the difficulty and went to the cross and died for your sins. You put your faith in that, that He died for you, He died for your sins, He was buried, He rose again for your justification. He will save you from your sins. And then you pick up your marching orders and you carry on as a good soldier of Christ and you fight this battle against our adversary, the devil. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We're thankful, Lord, for your word. We're thankful for the wisdom that it provides, the truth and the light. Thankful for your son who died for us on the cross. Lord, we pray that we would share that light of the gospel in a dark world as the ruler of this world, the God of this world, is looking to to stamp out the light, to stomp it out, to, to hide it, to deceive people from seeing it. But help us, Lord, to take that light and to shine it in this dark world so that people might come to the saving knowledge of what you've done for them on the cross. And Lord, that they would come to the knowledge of the truth. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.